welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is a Solidarity Friday episode, and today on the show we have Craig Heacock, a psychiatrist in Fort Collins, Colorado, and it's a really fun episode for me. We kind of uh, address a lot of the points that our, our recent Will Hall episodes raised, and yeah, we get into some of the issues in psychiatry generally, how we could improve it, like what's going on in psychiatry. Like, why is it not yet perfect? <laughs> and that's, you know, that's a big discussion. But yeah, we get into like how we can improve it. And it's, it's really an all hands on deck thing. And um, yeah, I'm just really uh, grateful for Craig. Craig reached out and uh, we got him on the show. So thank you, Craig. And don't really know what else I want to add here. Uh, but if y'all want to support us, please leave us a small monthly donation at Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash psychedelics today, or check out our classes at Psychedelic Education Center. We've got some new dates listed for our January edition of Navigating Psychedelics for Clinicians and Therapists. So uh, we'd love to have you. There's two editions there, one that's good for uh, London and the U.S. East Coast, and uh, another that's good for the rest of the U.S. And uh, a number of people from Australia actually joined that time slot. So again, psychedeliceducationcenter.com. Check it out. And uh, yeah, without further ado, here is Craig Heacock. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This will be one of our fun Friday episodes. Uh, today on the show, we have Craig Heacock, a psychiatrist in private practice in uh, your Fort Collins, Colorado. Fort Collins, Colorado. That's Beautiful. Right. Yeah. How are you doing today, Craig? Good. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh it's been too long. Like I've been aware of you for years and it's kind of yeah. goofy. Well, I've, been I've been sending you various emails. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So we, we had to talk at some point. Absolutely. Yeah. And and you've got a podcast of your own. What's what's it called? Yeah, I have a psychiatric storytelling podcast called Back from the Abyss. So I co-produce that and host that. And that's people telling their plunge into the psychological psychiatric abyss and how they got out. So it's really, mm. it's a podcast of stories of hope and healing and you know, people talking about the hard road of, of just going through the worst stuff and how they got out. Yeah. I had the chance to listen to uh, half of one of your, your favorite episodes. Um, and I was, I was kind mm. of impressed just with the, the production quality. It's like uh, this American life. It's such a, a well done thing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait to lot. finish the episode and check out more. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I guess let's give a little background on who you are. You spent eight years working at a psychiatric hospital um, mm -hmm. as a psychiatrist. Was that in Texas? No, that was here. Oh, okay. So yeah, I worked at a psychiatric hospital and clinic for eight years. And then I moved over to join Scott Shannon at the Holness Center in Fort Collins. And that's where the MAPS MDMA studies based out of that I've been working on. That's outstanding. And then a year ago, yeah, and then a year ago, I uh, left to just be on my own um, in Old Town, Fort Collins, right by my house. So I can just bike to work on my cruiser bike. And <laughs> <laughs> it's um, Fort Collins is a lesser known paradise for those who aren't from around here. It's uh, slightly less uh, well known than Boulder is, but it's so beautiful. And yeah, it's a lovely place. Yeah. I've, I've only been twice, but I've loved it each time. <laughs> um, I think I got to speak at the, uh, uh, I always do this wrong, at the university's uh, psychedelic club, <laughs> preaching oh, harm reduction, so yeah. <laughs> which is nice. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's always exciting sharing harm reduction with people who have never really received the message. Mm -hmm. And college students need that message. Oh my God, do they ever? <laughs> yeah. Like the amount of harm I could have sidestepped. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's sort of like a, I realized with my high school and college students that I see in my practice, you know, I always ask, hey, do you smoke weed? And and lately I realized you can't ask, you also have to ask, do you dab? Oh, or yeah. Like, do you, or do you, you know, smoke wax or oil? Because I've had so many people say, oh, no, I don't smoke weed. And then later I find out, oh, yeah, they have a huge THC thing going on. Like, well, you didn't, <laughs> you said you didn't ask about wax or dabbing. <laughs> oh, okay. But, and you'll, you'll find that with clients as well? Oh, Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating. And I think, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge harm reduction proponent. I don't know how you couldn't be and work in mental health, right? but it's not, the message is not out. Like people do not understand that, uh, even within, a, with a given substance, there are much safer and much less safe ways to, in context to use. Right. Absolutely. Like not all, uh, cannabis is created equal. 
not all no. meth or cocaine is created equal or heroin for that yeah. matter. And like yeah. free prescription heroin in Switzerland to like reduced ODs like crazy because you had a yeah. safe, normal supply. And yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I think if 15 years ago when I left residency, if someone said, oh, you will regularly see people have psychotic breaks with weed, I would have said, that's insane. There's no, <laughs> po- but I think, you know, there's been an arms race with marijuana and medical cannabis and increasing amounts of THC and pure THC and, you know, some percentage of the population is vulnerable to psychotic break with THC. And we didn't see that when it was 5%, 6%, but I regular, every month I see a couple people who have, you know, a major scary psychotic episode with, you know, from large amounts of THC. And I I wouldn't even thought that possible when I left residency. Mm. Long lasting events too? Um, Like more than a day? Yeah, that's a great question. It seems that if people don't have a genetic predisposition or big trauma history, they can usually snap out of it pretty quickly. If they have, you know, uh, bipolar diathesis or tendency towards schizophrenia, no, then that that can be the thing that flips. And that's been one of the many interesting things that came out of the, I think it's called the um, Australian Men's Study, something like this. Huh. Australia has followed. All young men starting like 35 years ago, they just had this incredibly comprehensive longitudinal study where they just look at everything about these men. And one of the things that's come out of that study is that cannabis THC use before age 15 is a major risk factor for de- developing schizophrenia. And that was a big surprise, but not before after 15. 15 that's but, fascinating. Yeah. So there's something, there's something about THC that can really trigger vulnerable people you know, with it, with the right genetic predisposition, we don't understand what that is, but it's clearly a thing. Mm. Read something this morning suggesting that, um, like cannabis from the sixties and seventies, like one to 3% THC. Mm-hmm. And now like regularly we're seeing 25 plus percent on, on flour. And then yeah, like 90 something percent, yeah. um, with, with waxes and distillate and whatnot. It's kind of, kind yeah. of wild. Like, um, I know it's like, I tell my patients, I said, look, you know, the, the weed of my high school and college days was like Coors Light. The weed of today is Everclear. Yeah, totally. It's, it's, it's the same thing, except it's completely different concentration, which, you know, risks wise and side effect, it's just a whole different thing. Mm-hmm. I don't think psychiatrists, I'm, I'm sure psychiatrists in the 80s were not seeing people have psychotic breaks with cannabis. I just can't right. even imagine that was, right. it just was not happening because right. it was so, so weak and it's, it's just a whole different thing now. Yeah. Well, that was a good sidebar, um, but that's, it's not what we're here to discuss. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think we did a reasonable enough amount of background, um, but you're, you are attached to the MDMA phase three study that maps the sponsoring in Fort Collins. Yeah. I've been working over the last three years with the Fort Collins site with the maps, maps. Great. So that was phase two as well because phase three just started somewhat recently. Yeah. This actually was all phase three that I've been part of. And then, and then I do a ton of ketamine work. I do most, mostly IV. I used to do Three, three and a half years ago, I did more IM, but mostly now intravenous, um, high dose, fully dissociative ketamine, probably doing mm, 12 to 15 sessions of that a week along with my regular practice. Mm. All right. And that's, it's, it's somewhat, uh, I don't want to call it standard psychiatry, like integrative psychiatry kind of approach. Yeah. I don't, you know, it's interesting that, um, that's a hot phrase, integrative psychiatry, yeah. which in my mind, that means good psychiatry because if my sense is if you're doing good psychiatry, you're very concerned about sleep and relationships and trauma history and diet and exercise and sun exposure and medical history. And I mean, you're concerned with all that, if, I think, if you're doing good psychiatry. So I think the whole, you know, quote unquote, integrative psychiatry is a response to you know, the over emphasis with a lot of psychiatry on just meds, which, you know, that's a whole separate issue. But yeah, I don't call myself an integrative psychiatrist, but I would like to think that's what I'm doing because I'm trying to look at it from all angles. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, how do we take a holistic approach? This has kind of been the trajectory for a lot of us who are, I guess, thinking people in, yeah. in the world. Like how do we, yeah, not, not miss important factors. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's a careful attention to detail, like a lot of reading. Mm-hmm. And that's how we, you know, evolve this thing. <laughs> it's unfortunately a very slow project, but I think we're making yeah. progress. Yeah. All right. So 
you emailed me probably right after listening to the first uh, recent Will Hall episode. Probably two minutes um, I think you said that. you pulled over yeah. twice <laughs> while listening to it. Yeah. 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 So I was in my car listening to the first Will Hall episode and I was thrilled at first because I thought, oh, this is a story of recovery and healing. And this is a guy who had terrible psychiatric illness, schizophrenia, and he's writing books and he's so eloquent and he's so intelligent. And so I was transfixed at first. And then he starts in on the, um, really on the, the whole anti-psychiatry thing. And I thought, oh, you know, he's such a smart, interesting guy. And I'm sure he's been through some horrible stuff with um, the psychiatry of 20, 30, year, 30 years ago. And, but then as it progressed, I realized, no, this was a full on <laughs> assault on a teammate. And let me, let me explain that. I, th- I often think of mental health treatment, like we're all on a, we're all on a soccer team you know, the breath workers and the trauma therapists and the marriage therapists and the priests and the life coaches and the psychiatrists, psychologists, we're all on this team and we're, we're playing this brutal, brutal team, the mental illness and psychological despair team. And they're, they're a handful. They've got meth on their team. They've got schizophrenia in their team. They have childhood sexual abuse on their team. They have crack cocaine and they have this endless onslaught of stuff that's coming at us. And it's all we can do as a mental health team to try to head it off. So when I heard Will speak, I thought, this is the post-game press conference where the midfielder is going on TV and saying, oh yeah, it's the goalies. Because the thing of the goalies, yeah, they, they play by their own rules with their funny shirts and, you know, they can touch the ball and they yell at the defenders and, you know, we don't need them. In fact, we would have a much better game if we could just dump goalies. And, you know, when, when he said, I I feel we should replace psychiatry with something else, I'm thinking, all right, what is it? And he had nothing, nothing, you know, he said, well, we should love and connect and talk. And And I said, yes. And to me, that would be like the midfielder saying, oh, we should pass and be fit and we should be a coordinated you know, attack and we should, you know, defend their most serious strikers. And and I'm saying, yes, but the fact is in this game, people break through the back lines and they're coming at me, the psychiatrist, the goalie, and they're blasting stuff at me. They're blasting their shots. They're throwing their bodies at me. And that's, you know, suicidal people, people threatening to kill their family members, people cutting themselves up with with razor blades, people who are threatening to go out and spray bullets downtown, people are hearing command hallucinations to sexually assault. I mean, the horrible stuff that's blasting through the back lines. And so I'm listening to Will and I'm thinking, really? So we should just dump the goalies and and just let everyone else in the field fight this horrendous team? So part of me kind of thought, okay, well, let's see how that goes. But I would know how that goes because... Every day in my office, I see what happens, you know, when, when all the hardworking other people on the mental health team are not able to stop what's coming. And it's scary and it's life-threatening often and it's, it's terrible. Mm. And, you know, I think, so, I think I speak for other psychiatrists when I say we would like nothing more for there to be more love and connection and, and healthier food and less institutional racism and just all the good stuff in society. And we want that. And if fewer people broke through the back lines and were shooting their aggressive, scary shots at us, that would be fantastic because we, we have enough on our hands. So, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm all about trying to make mental health treatment better. Clearly mental health treatment in the United States has huge problems. Psychiatry has major problems. But I think this sort of pan-negative critique, I think too, it it really hit me because in 2020, I mean, everything, it's the news is bad and you can't breathe the air and there's fires and political stuff and pandemic and economic collapse. And so to just listen to, you know, whatever it was, two and a half hours of the two episodes, just completely cutting the knees out on a mental health teammate which is me and everyone else in psychiatry. And, you know, I understand that psychiatrists have hurt people. You know, one of, um, one of my dearest friends is a ER doc. And he said once, he said, you know, the decision which specialty to pick in medicine, it's really about 
what kind of pain are you willing to inflict on other people? And I thought that was kind of a weird statement, but he, I think there's something to that. And here's the thing, the pain that psychiatrists inflict on people, the, the most painful thing we do is we put people in the hospital against their will. And that has been overused terribly all around the world. It's been used to imprison people politically. It's people have been given false diagnoses and held in the hospitals forever. In the U.S., it's been used terribly over the decades. I imagine in some parts of the U.S., some places it's still used inappropriately. But it also, in general, what I've seen is it saves lives. I mean, you know, when we put people in the hospital against their will, we're not taking it lightly. And I'm guessing that happened to Will and some of the other anti-psychiatry folks. And I feel badly for them. I'm sure they were hurt by it. And, you know, and the fact is, you know, somatic therapists hurt people and teachers hurt people and, and dentists hurt people. I mean, we, we all are fallible. And I just, I just want to put out a message you know, to all the listeners here that there are, there are amazing things happening in mental health treatment. There are serious problems in our lack in our system and in psychiatry itself. But let's, let's move forward and be teammates and help each other and not have a pan sort of um, negativiz- negativism, just to shut it all down. Um, it's just not, it's not, in, it's not helpful. And I think in 2020, which is one of the more depressing years we've had in a long time, it's, it's just so grim. And I just, you know, at one point I, uh, when I pulled over and was listening to Will talk, I thought, do you have anything positive to say? Do you have anything hopeful? And, um, I didn't hear anything hopeful except, you know, he said, stop the drug war, which I say, yeah, amen, let's do that. But I don't know. I I, um, really appreciate that you responded so quickly to my email and gave me the chance to, you know, spread the word that, hey, we know, we, meaning psychiatry, we know we've got changes to make and that there are problems. But sort of a pan dismissal of... Uh, we need to go and some mysterious thing needs to replace us. Uh, and again, I'm willing to listen, but I haven't heard anybody say what that is. <laughs> right. It's, um, you know, I guess my, it's two, twofold here. Like, I, I think this is always just a march of development in technology. Mm-hmm. You know, like how many times did your Apple computer give you that like rainbow wheel of death or whatever and (laughs) blue screen of death on your pc and like you know like i would have (laughs) my new computer like barely blue screens anymore like it's kind of crazy but it took till 2020 from you know the 1980s for this to happen you know medicine is often a little bit slower than the research coming out like yes Mm -hmm. there's a lot of research journals and but that doesn't necessarily mean the doctors are reading everything and trying to implement yeah. everything because they've been practicing for so long for on, you know, one method or one way of doing things. And it's kind of hard to adapt to new data like every single day because there's so much research happening. Yeah. Well, even, I, I think, yeah, there's so much I have to say on that, but one thing is even the words we use to describe things in psychiatry are so vague. So let's, let's just say depression. So I did a podcast episode where I, I looked at um, this whole idea of the syndrome of depression. And what I mean by that is, you know, d- depression is not a disease, like, you know, like multiple myeloma or pancreatitis. It's, it's a syndrome. It's a final common pathway. You can get there a thousand different ways. So, but when we talk about treating depression, it's such a, just that phrase is so compli- complicated because depression is so complicated. And even when we say, well, would psilocybin help with depression or would MDMA help with depression? <laughs> to me, the, the, the underlying question is, well, what kind of depression are you talking about? What sort of etiology? You know, a, a depression that's coming out of trauma, yeah, MDMA might be an effective way to address that. So um, these, these terms are batted around and, you know, some of the anti-psychiatry folks, you know, all, all over us because they say, oh, you know, you're, call, you're pathologizing everything and giving it disease names. And, but I, I think, you know, people, those of us who work in mental health know anxiety, depression, um, psychosis, these are syndromes. They're not, they're not diseases. They don't tell you anything about how the person got there. And that's, that to me is the, 
beauty, challenge, and mystery of mental health and psychiatry is to try to unpeel those layers and figure out, well, someone is presenting with this kind of emotional despair, but why? Mm -hmm. Um, And um, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately is that, you know, last couple of years, I've really shifted how I think about trauma and how trauma um, plays out in the psychiatric realm. So it turns out that I would argue that psychiatry has two things it just has not ever really addressed well. And so the first would be negative symptoms of schizophrenia. And the second would be trauma. Almost none of the psychiatric meds do anything for trauma. Talk therapy doesn't really work for trauma. And it really seems like the only thing that works for trauma are the somatic kind of therapies. But those are you know, those can take years to really get to these deep wells of trauma that sort of lie at the interface of the spirit and the body. And this, all this exciting stuff now that's coming with, you know, psychedelics and what might that do? And it's seeming like one of the things that psychedelics, at least some of them might do in some people is allow us to dip down, whether you want to call it the primary consciousness or chi or the soul or spirit, but bring us down to the kind of interface of the body and the spirit where trauma lies and where talk therapy and traditional psych meds can't touch it. And again, you can get there through different therapies, but it takes a long time. But you know, what we're seeing, what I'm seeing is that you can access that, that haunting, if you will. And I really think in my mind, that's what trauma, you know, deep trauma, it's a haunting. It is a, it's a, like a spiritual possession of the body, not in sort of a Casper the ghost thing, but it's, it's a, it's a pervasive, um, spiritual wound, you know, as Laura Northrup calls it on her podcast. So at one point, Will in this, his episode said, um, that uh, he said, I'm not sure psychedelics should be in the realm of medicine and science. And I, (laughs) I've never stopped. I made a little voice memo, memo on my phone. What does that even mean? Of course, psychedelics should be in the realm of medicine and in the realm of spiritual growth and of connecting with other people and connecting with nature and should be all of those things. But why would we say it shouldn't be in the realm of medicine if we can help people heal what what I think has been one of the two most untouchable things in, in mental health, which is how do we get to trauma? How do we actually touch trauma and move it? And, you know, I'm seeing that in the MDMA study. I'm seeing that in my ketamine work every day that you can touch those places that before were essentially untouchable and you can do it right away. You don't have to wait years. Are you seeing others in in psychiatry? Like, I feel, I feel that Colorado, California are kind of um, a little special. Like we've got a lot Mm -hmm. of people like, like yourself and Scott Shannon, many others. Mm-hmm. who are kind of informed on this stuff. Are you seeing others in psychiatry like be interested in these somatic techniques and or are people kind of dismissing of them? Yeah. Well, here's here's a good example. So, I I've called and talked to a number of other psychiatrist colleagues and friends in northern Colorado and beyond. And I've said you have to start using ketamine in your practice. It will blow your mind. It will change your life in the lives of your patients. And um, what most of them have said is, oh yeah, ketamine, that's so interesting. I'm way too busy. I just, I'm totally overwhelmed trying to do what I'm doing. And I've told them like, look, you will hospitalize many fewer people. You, you could see people walk in your office suicidal, ready to die. And within 12 hours, the hope is returning. And what I'm hearing from most people, and I've talked to a lot of people, is not that they don't think it's very interesting and and helpful, but they just like, man, I'm so busy. I don't even have time. And I even had a psychiatrist friend fly out from California, spend a day with me and watching ketamine sessions. And she said, oh, it's so cool, but man, I'm so busy. I don't even know how I would do this. So yeah, I haven't heard anything negative along those lines. I, I think going, going back to my metaphor of the soccer team, I think they're just, especially in 2020, we're just being shellacked here in the goal with so much pain that I think a lot of psychiatrists are just trying to keep their head above water, which is, I think they would much more enjoyably keep their head above water if they would use ketamine in their practices. (laughs) (laughs) I I do. It's, 
Yeah, I, I think I say that to my medical assistant all the time. I can't even remember, like, how did I treat people severely depressed and suicidal people before academy? Like, what did I do? And I think the answer was hospitalized way more people. What did that do? Well, you know, ostensibly kept them safe for a few days. I People were on a lot more meds. But the main thing is people were just suffering much more. I mean, I have a whole crew of people now who are doing what we call maintenance ketamine who come in every month and do an IV. And these are these were some of my most depressed, poorly functioning people before. And now they come in and do their monthly treatment and it keeps them above water. It keeps them out of suicidality. It's, it's, it's so gratifying. It's it's amazing. I don't know why I wish everybody in psychiatry would get on board, but yeah, I, I, luckily, as I said, I'm not hearing negative comments about it. Mostly just, Oh, that's cool. You're doing that. We're too busy to, <laughs> to get on board. I have a friend who's a palliative care doc and she's known me for years and really like, <laughs> um, we were a little standoffish around the psychedelic topic for a while. Mm-hmm. And, um, at a certain point, <laughs> um, cause she's seeing people die regularly and, you know, like probably a great research site for palliative care stuff, like mushrooms mm-hmm. and palliative care or something. And <laughs> at a certain point, she's like, what do you expect me to do? Feed them drugs, feed them these drugs, prescribe it and, and be there the whole time. That's crazy. I can barely get through my day as it is. And I, I think there's something about the structure of our medical system that mm-hmm. is probably the root problem here. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know what, how to actually name it even. Yeah. Um, but it's like under-resourced is probably the best yeah. word. Yeah. Well, I think I'll, I'll name it. I think at least psychiatric care in the United States has three, let's call it door number one, two, and three. Mm-hmm. Door number one is what I'm doing, which is uh, non-insurance practice. Um, I mean, I slide my scale for a lot of people, but I don't take insurance. I meet with people as long as I want to. I have a bunch of people that I do hour-long long-term therapy with. I do hour and a half ketamine. So I, I get to do what I want. And then, and those people, are, and I think psychiatrists, you probably on this podcast are more in that realm. But then behind door number two is a big group. And I know this is part of when the anti-psychiatry people are talking, they're talking a lot about door two and three. Door two are all the psychiatrists who are working with uh, insurance, um, doing quote unquote med checks, which are these 15 to 20 minute symptom-based visits, which I don't know how anything meaningful could come up in those. And those are cheaper. The people using those, are, the surprise, surprise, are people with fewer resources generally. And you know they're not getting as good a care because they're really getting symptom management. And then behind door number three is the mental health care, I'm sorry, the mental health center, center system where local and county mental health centers are working with largely indigent people, you know, very few resources. A lot of mental health centers are largely staffed by PAs and nurse practitioners because that's cheaper and not that they're not competent, but it's just, it is a resource thing. So yeah, in, in America, like with a lot of things, it's, uh, what are you willing to pay for? I mean, that's not the mm-hmm. way it is in most countries, but we, you know, we really do have a three part system and that they're very different, each part of the psychiatric doors. Mm. Right. It's like a big landscape with so much diversity that mm-hmm. it's really, and you know, yeah, like that, that door three, huge spectrum mm-hmm. there too. Mm-hmm. Like from, you know, some think like a, New York city situation Mm -hmm. versus like Akron, Ohio or something like there's, I know some amazing people that work, you know, in the door number three County and local mental health. I mean, they have just, I mean, so I'm not trying to, it's not on the individuals, right? It's like the situation they find themselves in. Yeah. To me, they're like inner city public school teachers. Yeah. What they're being asked to do is impossible, you know, with the resources and how sick people are and, and how uh, under resourced their population is. You know, most of the mental health centers in America, yeah, they're like or inner city public schools. And so the people that are working there, I mean, I have only so much admiration for them. And and I think too, if they were listening to this conversation, they would, I'm guessing they would say, oh, ketamine, fascinating, or MDMA, wow, that's really cool. And then they would just have to get back to their totally packed day 
with so many difficult people coming in the door who don't have the resources to even access treatment and they're trying to figure out how to keep people alive. Right. Yeah, it's a very different world. And mm-hmm. um, something, something I'm picking up on, I want to mention, um, like the <laughs> this idea of the psychedelics being a single bucket. It's mm-hmm. kind of complicated, right? Like there's many classes of psychedelics, you know, like we, yeah. I like to, I like the term classical psychedelics a mm-hmm. lot. It's, I find it helpful. I don't know that it means too much. It's just like, this is two different kinds of drugs versus like the, you know, 15 possible classes of mm-hmm. psychedelic, uh, drugs that could what, um, instantiate psychedelic experience like ketamine mm-hmm. and MDMA. Mm-hmm. Cause like, you know, these are non-classical psych drugs, non-classical psychedelic drugs that do in some situations instantiate psychedelic experiences and the mechanism of action is so different. I feel like mm-hmm. psilocybin will be a lot spookier for a lot longer than mm-hmm. ketamine and MDMA. Mm-hmm. Though sp- I'm sure spooky shit happens with both of those drugs too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, at one point too, kind of going back to this idea that psychedelics shouldn't be in the realm of medicine and science, Mm -hmm. as Will said. I mean, I couldn't disagree more because there's so, there's so much we need to study. So let's just look at ketamine. We don't know whether people benefit more from a fully dissociative treatment or a sub dissociative treatment. I mean, I I think a lot of people who work with ketamine are pretty sure that fully dissociative ketamine is more effective for treating severe depression, suicidality, and severe PTSD. But that's not, that's being studied now, but we don't know we don't know what the optimal dosing strategy is. We don't know. We don't even know if integration after ketamine is necessary for everyone. My sense is like so many things, it's probably helpful for some people and not necessary for others. And I see that with my ketamine patients that some people in their ketamine sessions, really intense childhood stuff comes up and and that catalyzes some powerful psychotherapy. And other people, a lot of other people, just leave and they say, wow, that was just fucking weird. And then they leave, you know, right. and then they text me two days later and they say, I feel so much better. Thank you. Hmm. So there's just so many, and they're really interesting questions. Uh, and, and I think Will mentioned was that, oh, we're all hung up on molecules and neurochemistry and wiring, but that stuff is fascinating because it lets me just use one example. So now we know the serotonin 2A receptor, that's crucial for tryptamine psychedelic effect. And if you block that, like with a psychiatric med, you will have no experience with psilocybin or LSD or DMT. Right. How, inter- how interesting is that? Like I saw it firsthand, like 14 grams with this one yeah. woman in Jamaica and like near zero effect. It's crazy. Yeah. Right. And so, so by studying, you know, the serotonin 2A receptor, we're not claiming to know all, but you know, Will was talking about we need to do more experiential kind of studies and phenomenal, phenomenological. That's awesome. But I think we should be doing it on every end. We, you know, by studying receptor subtypes, the you're not funding's going... barely there is the kind of the crux, right? <laughs> like yeah. You can yeah. barely get funding to do the straight research, Not never mind yeah. like the humanistic yeah. stuff. Yeah. I guess where I'm trying to... I'm trying to explain that I think the we may we may never understand the mind brain connection fully, but don't we want to try? Right. Like I want people to keep going and hunting. Like I don't mm-hmm. I don't personally never I, I I don't hold out hope that I'm going to see like the real answer in my lifetime, but I want mm-hmm. people to keep working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um absolutely. Yeah. Like I <laughs> you know, we're we're kind of heavily Groff focused here. So we're mm-hmm. always like, you know, eh, <laughs> I don't think we're going <laughs> to necessarily ever find it, but you know, it mm-hmm. doesn't mean we should stop. Um, mm-hmm. cause the more we know, the more we know and the more mm-hmm. we can help people. Yeah. But it, you know, it's also disappointing for us in, in this more kind of depth psychology landscape to see that this stuff is barely getting researched at all. Like mm-hmm. when was the last paper published on like etiology of depression, you know, like that was actually really meaningful. Mm-hmm. Like that's yeah. probably, probably a while back. Yeah. Like yeah. Eddie, uh, did you ever hear this uh, interview Groff did with uh, Tim Ferriss? It was like three hours long. I did hear that. Yeah. That was really interesting. Yeah. Like I, I appreciated Groff's candor and saying like, I, I just really want <laughs> etiology researched in like the, the kind of Freudian sense mm-hmm. of how mm-hmm. Freud was doing it. Now we have a tool <laughs> like psychedelics mm-hmm. that would actually make it more feasible than, than what Freud was doing. 
right? Even just to sort of answer the question, is there trauma? Because, you know, we're finding with, you know, ayahuasca work, a lot of tr- psychedelic work that people are, some people are going to these sessions and, you know, their conscious brain is saying, oh yeah, there's no trauma. And we're finding out there's some serious trauma yeah. that's just an, underneath the surface. And again, if we don't know that, how can we get to the roots of anything? I mean, that's not to say that all depression is trauma related. I've heard some people claim that oh, depression always rises out of trauma. That's not true. I think often, you know, very often, but not not always. But you know, almost like we use a uh, you know CT scan to see w- what's happening in your innermost self. It'd be interesting to think of using psychedelics as sort of a psychi- uh, psychological diagnostic tool to say, hmm, is there depression in there? I mean, I'm sorry, is there trauma in there? And there might be like, oh, actually, wow, you have a pretty healthy attachment style and you have love and calm and connection. And that's awesome. Let's move on. Yeah. Or, or not. And I, I was chatting with somebody just uh, earlier this week and, and <laughs> their, def, their uh, label on ayahuasca was diagnostic tool. And I'm mm. like, you know, yeah, I think mm-hmm. traditionally for sure. And I, I, mm-hmm. I totally agree that this could be used really skillfully for diagnosis mm-hmm. and like mm-hmm. root cause analysis kind of stuff. Yeah. Like why I mean, now, are you doing I mean, that? Yeah. I've worked with people for years, years before it came to the surface that there was significant trauma. Mm. And, you know, sometimes because people don't want to talk about it, but a lot of times because it's just very buried and it's recontextualized and people have come up with a non-trauma narrative about trauma. Mm. which which might help them cope in the here and now but does not you know does not get to this deep you know haunting i, I also have this image of trauma as like pus you know and surgery they always talk about the pus has to come out no matter where pus pocket is in the body you got to drain it mm-hmm. and i really think about that with especially childhood trauma like it, it has to come out and you know we see that in my office regularly with you know, fully dissociated ketamine sessions, people come in and, you know, if they don't have big childhood trauma, it doesn't come out. But, you know, I've now realized I have to give people a little FYI um, warning, like, hey, let's just really talk a little bit about childhood trauma and what we're looking at, what might be there, because that very well might come bubbling up at the end of one of the sessions. Mm. Again, very diagnostic and, and oftentimes a great springboard for therapy. Yeah, because I really think ketamine I'm seeing has, it has therapeutic value in and of itself. It's doing a number of things to the brain to dial down severe depressive symptoms and suicidality. But it's also a catalyst. I mean, it also, particularly for trauma, it can bring those deep wells to the surface where they can start to be addressed, you know, in integration or psychotherapy, whatever you want to call it. And it's like a twofold bonus you get, um, especially for folks with trauma who are doing ketamine, which is um, that's a good question. Maybe maybe half my people doing maintenance ketamine have a pretty significant trauma history. Hmm. That's interesting. So one of, I forget if we touched this already, so steer me in the right direction if we did, but like um, this idea of, you know, we got to, potentially just scrap psychiatry, mm-hmm. <laughs> create something new. You mentioned that Will didn't really offer anything new. Mm-hmm. Like what, what would, where would you like say, yes, we have problems in psychiatry for sure. We've, we've established mm-hmm. that. Like people know that, like what, what would be some things that you could think of that, that could help maybe accelerate us from this? Like, like t- let's take funding. <laughs> uh, both on the um, clinical end, like the clinic end, and then on the research end as a, as a for granted. But like, is there things beyond that? Mm-hmm. Well, part of the reason that door number two, door number three, those mm-hmm. types of psychiatry exist because there's such a shortage, not just of funding, but of actual psychiatrists. There's right. a huge shortage. So, you know, and I've talked about this in other venues, but, you know, if everybody was doing what I'm doing, oh my gosh, that there'd just be complete lack of services. Because, you know, I see a lot of people for half hour, hour longer, and so many psychiatrists don't do that, which I think is A, not great care, but B, allows them to serve a lot more people. And there is such a shortage of folks. And that's that's been true for years and it's getting worse. 
So, but I also think too, psychiatry is very, um, we're very cut off, not just from the rest of medicine, but even from the rest of our mental health teammates. And that's why I often think of this metaphor of the, that we're on this team, but we're the goalies. Like right. we're wearing these funny jerseys and we're in the back and we have different rules and we're on the team, but we're also, we, we have weird rules and we do strange things and we're key to the team, but we're not really doing what everybody else is doing. So there is a, there's a level of isolation in psychiatry, which is not good. And I'm a perfect example. I work alone in, in my office on, this, on Mountain Avenue. And, you know, I, I do collaborate with a lot of people, but I... And that's one of the reasons I was really excited to come on here is to it's just to talk and network and put the word out. And again, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, with my podcast, I, I want people to hear that healing is possible. And I want people to hear about the different cool things happening in mental health treatment and psychiatry. And, and let's emphasize the positive and do more of that. So I, I really, I like this idea of let's um, lead by attraction. Let's focus on what's working um because in inevitably the people everybody working in mental health wants to help people and so but yeah i wish that i don't think there are any easy answers for how to change psychiatry because in some ways psychiatry is has, has uh, fallen into this three-pronged system because that's that's the way it has to be with the shortage of people and with you know, how unhealthy our society is. And yeah, I don't, I, I don't have any brilliant <laughs> answers there. Right. Um, so it seems like it, it, honestly, it seems like a resource question. Like we, we have a problem. Like, uh, I, th I think there's something about a lot of MDs not wanting to go into psychiatry. I don't, I don't know mm -hmm. exactly why it's maybe not as mm -hmm. sexy as doing knee replacements or <laughs> heart mm -hmm. surgery or something. Well, but I think we're, I think one of the reasons that I hear this a lot is um, that psychiatry is so kind of mysterious. And, you know, I, I, one of my best friends has said, uh, he's an interventional cardiologist. And he said, why do you want to be a psychiatrist? Like, they don't understand their diseases. They don't understand their meds. The brain's a mystery. It's all black box. Like, why would you ever want to do that? And uh, to me, that's what's so interesting about it is that there is so much mystery and there's it gets to the heart of who we are because, um, you know, if you have a toenail fungus or dysfunctional kidney or hardening of your aorta, I think we can all say, well, that's just a part of me. That's not me. But if you have something wrong with the way you think, feel, or perceive, or your emotions, I mean, what's more core to us than that? And also what's more mysterious than that? So I, I was drawn to that from the get-go. But I think a lot of medical students are very... Mm. they're very concrete and they like systems and they like if you can put input a and b and get c and d and predict that they like that and psychiatry is not that way <sighs> it would be lovely if we can get there but i, I think it like I, in a lot of ways groff was right about etiology we haven't spent that time mm -hmm. yeah so yeah, it seems like yeah, there there needs to be more attraction. Like how do we actually make psychiatry more interesting? I think psychedelics is the answer to that, honestly. Like I do yeah, I had I do too, because even I have a med student rotating with me now from CU uh Denver and she doesn't want to be a psychiatrist, but the whole academy thing's been super fascinating for her. Yeah. And she said, Hey, she said, some of my other med student classmates want to come rotate with you. They want to see this academy thing. Yeah. So yeah, I think because even my kids, I have three daughters. They've said, "Dad, I can't believe you just get paid to go talk to people. That's just so <laughs> weird. Like that's all you do all day is just talk to people." Which was largely what I was doing. But now, uh, I talk to people, and then we give them eye shades and music and a blanket, and then we send them, you know, into the eighth dimension of ketamine. Right. So, and then they come out, and and then it's like I step into my shaman role, and it's it's fascinating. Yeah, again, even people who aren't particularly interested in mental health or psychiatry, I think can get really interested in this idea that you can give someone a, a powerful mind changing substance that can allow them to ac access parts of themselves that they didn't even realize were there. Yeah. Like where, where else in medicine is that kind of like mystery, you know, like it's yeah. so, 
Yeah. Fascinating. I think the one other place it is, is in hospice care and palliative work. Totally. Because everything is really real and in the moment when, when you're approaching death. Yeah. And I've often thought if I couldn't do psychiatry, I would want to be a hospice doctor because it's so, it's just so real and it's so important and it's so hard and it's, and it's so mysterious, you know, what, what's happening, what's going to, it's just, it's the great unknown, which, you know, that's what we're dealing with too. The mind is the great unknown. Right. Right. Yeah. Like the fact that there are mysteries left, big mysteries. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like what one of my favorite things about psychology in general is that there's no like real shared consensus theory even mm-hmm. like so many different branches everywhere and like the you know the number one field really is behaviorism largely like CBT mm-hmm. CBT seems mm-hmm. to get all the dollars for some reason yeah right but right they're all models right yeah, you know, internal family systems and psychodynamics and cognitive behavioral and dialectic behavior. Yeah, there are all these interesting models of the mind and the way we function and dis- go into the dysfunction. And I, but I love that too. I just again, I often think of the different types of therapy, like like when you go to the optometrist and they flip the little things, like is this better or this one, this or this, or this. And to me. You know, when I'm sitting with my patients, I have probably four or five you know, main models of, of psychotherapy that I think about. And so I'm thinking in my mind, like I'm, I'm literally kind of flipping different lenses, thinking, like, hmm, is this a psychodynamic kind of case? Or is this more of like an existential thing? Or mm. can we do some straight up CBT with this person? And that, that's very overwhelming and scary at first when you're learning all those. But once you have two or three or four things in your tool belt. It's, it's fun to sit there. But again, they're just models. They're not real. They're, they're models of something unknowable. Right. Yeah. (laughs) To this point in history, unknowable. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Hopefully someday. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So were there other critiques of the, of the will episode you wanted to raise? Yeah. You know, he, he was talking about the MDMA study, um, MAP study, and he said, you know, why don't we just do therapy with traumatized people? And, well, we we do therapy with traumatized people, and there's there are some effective non-psychedelic therapies, uh, somatic experiencing and EMDR and uh, Hakomi. There's a number of therapies that can help. Uh, they tend to take a long time, and one of the biggest hurdles people have been traumatized is trust. And you know, it can take years for trauma therapists doing traditional non, say non-psychedelic trauma therapies to make that trust and connection. Mm. But but say with the MDMA work, we're seeing that happen almost immediately. Um, which is fantastic and which also, you know, speaks to some of the serious risks of the psych- psychedelic space and boundary violations and sexual boundary violations. And um, so I guess, so yeah, when Will's saying, you know, why are we trying to address trauma with a pill? I don't think any of us are. I don't think anybody on the MAP study or or people, I'm, I don't know people on the psilocybin side. I, I really don't think anybody's thinking, ooh, we're going to fix PTSD with psilocybin or we're going to, you know, fix MDMA, or I'm sorry, fix trauma with this 150 milligram MDMA capsule. Nobody's thinking that. I think what we're thinking is, this is a catalyst. Um, resources are limited. Um, I had a woman on my podcast who talked about her six-year healing journey with EMDR and amazing, amazing recovery. But it was, I don't know, like 200 sessions and mm. a ton of money and time. And it was brutal slog. It was like an ultra marathon over the Himalayas, but she did it. But we don't have the resources to do that with everybody, nor do most people have the the economic or the just emotional wherewithal to do that kind of multi-year slog for trauma. Uh, and the ones who do, great. But we need we need to get in there quickly and get working on this. And that's what's so exciting to me about psychedelics coming online with mental health is that we can get down to business quickly and not 
not have to spend so much time trying to get past these defenses. Mm. Mm-hmm. One of our, uh, or one of my talk tracks often is around um, just how young we are, mm-hmm. <laughs> how early we are in science generally. Like if you want to maybe put a, <laughs> an event on it, like when was the first, you know, double blind, you know, RCT kind of deal mm-hmm. done. Mm-hmm. Like that was probably the biggest evolution mm-hmm. in, our, in our lifetime. And that's often the only acceptable science these days, right? Yeah. Like yeah. we can't really take the historical psychedelic literature too well. I, I was talking to a uh, Peter Hendricks from um, university of Alabama, Birmingham is doing the psilocybin for cocaine mm-hmm. study. He's like, I, I just don't know what to do with that data whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, mm-hmm. I think you do perhaps, but like the, mm-hmm. the model and how you were trained doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily accept this enormous pile of literature as helpful. Yeah. yeah. But I think it's, you know, I, I think we can learn from that. I think we can say, well, these things appear to be really helpful mm-hmm. and they should be prescribable. There's no reason why <laughs> the this legacy of the drug war should let so many more people suffer for so long. Yeah. And we need more tools. <laughs> we, you know, it, we are getting at times beaten badly on the field here by this team of the, the mental illness and psychological despair team. And yeah, if there's things that can help us. Um, oh, I wanted to bring up one other thing though. Yeah. I was just remembering that, that will a couple other things that he brought up in the episode. One is um, he talked about this idea of spiritual emergency versus you know, true psychosis or psychotic illness. And he's, you know, he really poo-pooed the idea that, that there's a bona fide psychotic state. He said, you know, maybe it's really all just like a spiritual emergency or spiritual experience. And he said, you know, quote, you're having a spiritual experience if you say you're having a spiritual experience, which that sounds fine, except I, I have seen, as anybody who works in psychiatry, we've seen many people who say things uh, like that that are patently untrue, like... Um, God's telling me to cut off my penis or um, uh, I'm hearing a voice saying, and I, it's, it sounds very powerful. I need to go downtown and spray bullets in old town square. And um, I mean, the thought that that's, a, I guess that could be like some demon spirit or Satan or something, but you know, I, I do think people have spiritual experiences and emergencies that can be very distressing and overwhelming, but that is not what we're talking about with a psychotic break or psychosis. I mean, um, people often, and that, that's one of the things that's, I think, so difficult in psychiatry is, is the more ill people get, they lose their insight and judgment. So the most ill people we see often think there's nothing wrong. Mm. So people come into my office um, who, who are pretty sure nothing's wrong, not uncommonly, they're, they're in a really serious psychotic state. And they've been brought in by their family or others. And you know, at one point, Will said, he said, the biggest difference I see between these two groups, the truly psychotic and the spiritual emergency, is class background. The upper, upper class people get to have a spiritual emergency. A lower class has, psych, quote unquote, psychosis. I, I couldn't disagree more. I mean, I work in Fort Collins, which is one of the more educated places in America, I work with lots of people who have resources and they get psychotic frequently for all sorts of reasons. And it's no spiritual emergency. And because I think the people who are having, you know, bona fide spiritual, spiritual emergencies, they're not showing up at the psychiatrist's office. I mean, they might be showing up uh, at their therapist or at their pastor or with a friend. The people who are coming to my office you know, are in severe distress or they're so ill that they're causing their family severe distress. So I know the, the anti-psychiatry movement is really anti-diagnosis. And I just, again, I would say we know, hello, we know in psychiatry that our diagnoses are largely syndromes. They're not bona fide diseases, they're syndromes, but that doesn't mean they're not oftentimes deeply dangerous and cause 
people and or their families horrific distress. And the whole idea that this sort of euphemism that that that's it's all a spiritual emergency, I think that's a that's actually dangerous thinking. Mm. Because, you know, sometimes people are sort of quietly psychotic. They're I, mean, I think a lot of people are sort of quietly psychotic out there. They're having uh, experiences and perceptions which are not real, but it's not causing them necessarily any serious distress. But you know, people come in the mental health system or specifically psychiatrists when they're having psychotic symptoms that are causing either they, themselves or other people very great distress. Mm. Um, so, and, and at one point, you know, Will, Will was even challenging the idea of schizophrenia. And again, I would just go back to, you know, we know, meaning we, we psychiatrists know it is, it is a syndrome. Nobody's saying there's a disease of schizophrenia. It's a syndrome. There's many different paths to it involving probably to- toxoplasmosis and herpes virus and cytomegalovirus and, and prenatal insults and genetic predisposition. Um, interestingly, he said, you know, that the major risk factors for, uh, schizophrenia diagnosed for poverty and child abuse. That's actually not true. But yeah, I do think that there's this, a misperception that, you know, that we psychiatrists think that the DSM is filled with bona fide diseases. No, we know it is a huge um, book filled with subcategories, largely for insurance billing purposes. It's not grounded in like a bona fide nosology. And, you know, we know that. Um, and again, I think people who, psychiatrists who have the time to really know people, we're curious why. Why are you depressed? Why are you having panic? Why are you so numb? Why do you want to die? I mean, ultimately, that, that's the most interesting and the most helpful question. Mm. Yeah, the spiritual emergency topic is so political, I guess. Mm-hmm. It's... Um, we have a class, a free class, uh, called spiritual emergence or psychosis. And like, I, I, I kind of feel bad cause it's like the, there's no clear, you know, I, I can't come up with a clear framework for one or the other. No. Um, but I, th- but I think we need to admit that both poles exist. Um, let me just give you one of a hundred examples I could give. So I, when yeah. I was in residency, I was working when, uh, started rotation at the partial hospital at Rhode Island hospital and the attending said, Hey, can you do a quick discharge with this guy? So this guy came in and he was nicely dressed and I was doing his discharge paperwork. And, and I looked at him and I said, wait, we met in the ER. He's like, Oh, I don't remember. I was not really in a good state of mind. So here was a guy, he was getting ready to go to his engineering job. He had a tie on. He, he was fine. He was healthy. And, uh, probably eight days before in the middle of the night, I met him in the ER. I went in to see him. He was naked. He was masturbating and licking the wall and talking about some like spaceship thing mm-hmm. and, and making this weird buzzing noise. And so he's hospitalized. He was put on medication. He went to partial hospital. Eight days later, I see him in a tie looking good and going off to his work. And was that a spiritual emergency? I mean, I don't think so. If that wasn't psychosis, I don't know what was. And in fact, you know, most psychotic experiences, people barely remember. There's a weird sort of amnesia that happens both during mania and psychosis that people will have sort of dreamlike, kind of almost like an alcohol blackout. Like people mm-hmm. will remember like frames of it, but it's mostly forgotten. Whereas, you know, my sense is a, a bona fide spiritual experience or a spiritual emergency, I think you would remember that. I think those those tend to be deeply uh, both meaningful or frightening, or, or they you're able to recall them. Where a bona fide psychotic episode, people rarely remember much of anything from it. No, I I, I like that, Craig. That's pretty cool. Um, and I think I think there's something there. Um, most people I know that have had some sort of spiritual emergence, they they are they remember it and cherish it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. even if it was terrifying, they still cherish it mm-hmm. <laughs> and to be, to be clear, not spiritual emergence. Isn't like, you know, sunshine and rainbows for everybody. It can be horrifying mm-hmm. as horrifying as probably, you know, stuff that can get you hospitalized. 
Yeah. Because spiritual yeah. emergencies can't get you hospitalized. It's like no yeah, joke. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think it's okay and even important that we recognize that both of those exist, just like we can say mind exists and brain exists. And, you know, I think that Will was really wanting to hold on to one pole of many arguments and not wanting to say, hey, it's complicated and it's gray and there's problems with all this and psychedelics are complicated, psychiatry is complicated, the brain's complicated. And, and isn't that cool? How, isn't that so interesting? And wow, we all got to work together and figure this out and not turn on each other. And, mm. and it's, this work is hard enough already. You know, it, it, you have a lot of people I know that work in mental health, you know, have been vicariously traumatized and I've done a few episodes about, about that on my podcast. And that's definitely been the case with me. I've had eight suicides and two murders and two people threatened to kill me. And one person had to be interestingly had to be hospitalized involuntarily for two weeks until he finally told the psychiatrist that he wasn't going to kill me. So it's getting, it's interesting. So I have some skin in the game and with mm. this too, that the anti-psychiatry movement is so terribly against involuntary hospitalization. And, and I would say in general, I'm not a huge fan of it either. I do everything I can to not do it. And I think most psychiatrists don't like doing it because it causes a lot of pain for people, but Sometimes you have to do it. Mm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's um. You know, like <laughs> the reality of human existence is not super pleasant all the time, and we've got no. We've got a lot of problems no. that we need to work yeah. on. And, yeah. yeah. Well, I was thinking too when I was listening. I think it was the first. Hmm, I think it was the first Will Hall episode when he was doing a big critique of capitalism. And, you know, I thought I got the little smile on my face and I was thinking of um, Shulgin's work. So Shulgin's, you know, changed the world with his work. And it was funded by the DEA and it was funded by his very successful invention. I think of one or two big pesticides. Yep. DuPont, I think. Yeah, right. So, uh, you know, and ketamine, I'm sure made a lot of money for the drug company that Mm. invented that. And, you know, now that I work with Academy and I think, wow, I hope they did make a lot of money because it's definitely changing people's lives. So yeah, capitalism is messy and psychiatry is messy and, and psychedelics are messy and people are messy. And isn't that okay? Like, can't we just accept that and not default to this sort of pan negativism and finger pointing and blaming? And because um, again, we're all on the same team. We want the same thing. We, we want people to thrive and we want to dial down psychological despair as much as we can. And we want to try to be helpful. Do you have any advice for people who like um, are perhaps like therapists that want better alliances with uh, MDs? Mm. Sometimes yeah. it's a, you know, a messy relationship. I've, I've met a number mm. of psychiatrists that I, I want nothing to do with and for the rest <laughs> of my life. <laughs> and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, but it's like, how do we handle that? You know, yeah, and do yeah. better. Yeah. Well, I think it is true. Here's another little secret of psychiatry. You know, there's definitely, there's a, there's a good chunk of psychiatrists, I think like me who went to med school and said, okay, this is the only thing I want to do. I love this. This is my calling. And I, and then I think there's a group who thought, Ooh, I don't want to deal with pap smears and I don't want to deal with this or that. I don't know what I want to do. I guess I'll do this. And then there's a third group, you know, a small group, but I think who are mostly went into psychiatry to try to figure out what's wrong with them. Mm. So, but the, the group one, the people who went into psychiatry because they're truly moved to um, by it and called to it, that's an increasingly large group. I really believe it is. Even in med school, the the percentage of people matching in psychiatry has been going up, up, up oh, every great. year for the past 15 years. So uh, psychiatry is definitely coming back. But yeah, there are uh, there are some really bad and weird psychiatrists for sure. So, I, so I guess what I'd recommend to therapists is you know you you reach out and you find out who your people are. You know, I've been in Fort Collins now for 15 years, and over the years. Um, had many, many, many phone calls with therapists and and struck us some cl- close collegial relationships and friendships with a bunch of them. And 
And then, you know, and some of the therapists have said, oh, I've tried to call other psychiatrists and they didn't even call me back. And you know, my answer was, wow, I'm sorry. That's, that's a big loss for them. But I'm glad that you kept calling and called me or vice versa. So, and, and I will say too, a lot of the people, the psychiatrists who work, you know, in the second or third system of the, the managed care um, med check system or the mental health care system, they're just so swamped trying to see so many people a day that I think trying to collaborate with therapists is overwhelming for them. But I do think people that are doing more of the kind of practice that I'm doing, which is, again, a lot of psychiatrists, a lot of us want to collaborate because, you know, we need help. I don't know. I mean, I, all my people with, with serious childhood trauma, I always get a child or I get a trauma specialist on board. All my people with eating disorders, I get an eating disorder specialist on board. I mean, I, I want to collaborate. I don't want to just be back here by myself. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, you know, again, big, messy system. It's not clear the path forward, mm-hmm. right? It's like, reach out, take risks, talk to these folks. Um, mm-hmm. And hopefully you can get a, a team of allies around you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I feel like the, the impression I get sometimes not all the time because I get to talk to some really cool people. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of great, but yeah, like doctors, like the, the messy ones who are kind of overwhelmed, they just, mm-hmm. you know, their, their perhaps default is you don't know anything and I, I don't want to talk to you about this. Mm, yeah. And that's about like the biggest turnoff you can. That is, that's horrible. Yeah. So I think <laughs> scratch those people off your list. Right. Yeah. Um, There's plenty of interesting people that are, that are cool yeah, out there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I would say to therapists, just keep reaching out and some number of psychiatrists are going to want to collaborate and to be happy to hear from you. And don't take it personally, the ones you don't hear back from. It's at this probably they're just drowning in work and stress and they're just trying to get through their day. Right, right. Yeah. And like, uh, I think a lot of folks kind of fantasize about this Kaiser Permanente model being like super advanced, but mm-hmm. I, think, I think we can do better. Like, I think even with just a loose association and sharing data, mm-hmm. like we can do really well, like without having a monster hospital system. It's just kind yeah, of like, like got to be carefully totally done. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this has been super fun and interesting. Yeah. yeah. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much, Joe. Yeah. You got it. Um, Craig, you, do you have a website or anything you might want to share? Yeah. My website is craigheacockmd.com. Great. C-R-A-I-G heacockmd.com. And you can also access Back from the Abyss there. And um, Back from the Abyss is also on all the podcast platforms. Perfect. Yeah. Well, Craig, thank you very much. And I, I hope we can do this again, maybe in person yeah. someday. Yeah, it was really great to do this. Thank you very much. Yeah, you got it. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in for that. I hope it was interesting. Uh, let us know what you think. Email us over at psychedeliceducationcenter.com. If you want to join our Facebook group, you can go to facebook.com uh, and just type in Psychedelics Today group and join us there. And I think there are well over 4,000 people in there and lots of great discussion. So come join us and uh, yeah, we'd love to have you. And again, if you want to support us, check out our free classes at psychedeliceducationcenter.com or maybe some of our um, less expensive courses. And there's a lot of great stuff there. We're getting a lot of amazing reviews And I believe we have a 45-day money-back guarantee. So you're pretty covered if you uh, don't like it. So yeah, again, psychedeliceducationcenter.com. And I think that's it for now. I hope you all have a great weekend and we'll see you on the next episode. Joe Moore signing off for Psychedelic Today. Bye-bye.